Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And just can I have your attention just for the usual um, safety announcement before we start in, in a minute. Um, please take note of the emergency exits. There's one at the back of the room and one here at the side as well. And if you do need help, there's members of the Policing Authority staff in the room. Um, as usual, our meeting this afternoon will be streamed live, so um, just be aware of that. And can everybody please check that their mobile phone is switched off or in airplane mode? And again, as usual, um, you may be recorded if you're present as part of the record. Please keep silent at all times. This is a meeting between the authority and, and the Guard Commissioner and his colleagues, and you're present to observe. There won't be any opportunity for anyone other than the authority and Guard their representatives to speak during the meeting. Um, thank you very much. Josephine. Well, and, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome again to the Commissioner and to your team. We have... One new person who hasn't been with us before in public session. Chief Superintendent Cleary, you're welcome in particular. And I see some other familiar faces that we haven't seen for a while. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Finn, we haven't seen you for a while, so welcome back. Um, this afternoon's agenda begins with the Commissioner's monthly report. And the uh, discussion from the authority side is going to be led by Pat Costello. So, Pat, if you'd like to start. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, first of all, thank you for the report. Uh, the report provides a lot of detailed information uh, which the authority welcome and thank you for that. Uh, we also want to acknowledge the really good work that you've outlined in the operational front and maybe we'll get back at the end of it, hopefully time permitting, to give you an opportunity to comment on that. So I might start with uh, maybe taking pretty much in the order you've given us the information maybe on finances and uh, I was looking at the overtime and the spend for January 7.2 million and I suppose I'm just wondering, is that on track for year-end? Do you see um, overtime budget being, um, overtime spend being in line with the overtime budget for the year? Because it is an important part of your pay budget. Oh, I absolutely acknowledge it. it's a very important part um, of our pay budget. And uh, we are working very hard to make sure that our actual spend stays constrained within the budget. I, I think um, it's a good bellwether for the, the way we manage our finances, and it's a very clear illustration that we have um, a grip on our money and how it's spent, making sure it's used for an operational purpose. Um, there is pressure on that budget, uh, that's, that's undoubtedly the case. Um, but um, my operational commanders work hard to make sure that um, the budget is properly managed. Okay, because we're two months into the, into, the, into the calendar year, which leads me to a more general question. Um, do you think you have uh, the resources and the systems in place in terms of accountancy and, and otherwise that will enable you to receive from your team uh, timely and accurate information so that you can adjust, adjust expenditure accordingly? It's a challenge for every organisation, so... It's never, I'm sure it's never perfect, um, but just wondering, um, how do you feel at this stage into the job? Are you getting the information and do you have the resources to provide you with the information on a timely basis and accurate information? Um, the information in the organisation certainly is accurate, but it could be more timely. We are without really the digital computerised systems that one would wish to see so that you can very closely observe expenditure, not just in this area, but in other areas such as uh, you know, yes, travel yeah. and subsistence, yeah. but in other budget heads as well. So um, those, those systems uh, are there, but they're by and large paper-based systems, and um, it's part of the digitization that we seek to achieve uh, to upgrade those. Yeah, so it's not ideal if they're, no, if they're largely paper-based, so... Uh, I presume that is something you will give priority to as part of your ICT, maybe going forward, because uh, you do need you do need timely timely information. Okay, Commissioner, thanks for that. Maybe uh, some HR. Uh, maybe the first one is redeployment, the one we've been giving you and all the talking about you for, for some time. And in 2018, 218, or sorry, 261. Um, if you like, Gardaí are available now to move to to operational operational duties. Uh, so you achieved 261 in 2018, and I just noticed in your report, in two, 2019, uh, it's off to a very slow start in January, I think it's three I, I saw in the report. 
So I just want to get your reaction to that. Uh, what, what is the target for 2019 and uh, how do you think you're going to achieve that and will you achieve it? Uh, well, um, we have milestones at each quarter for this year. So the, the first milestone for the 31st of March is um, deployment, redeployment of 75. So we're set in course uh, to achieve that. Um, to achieve the figure of, of 500 um, will require actually um, uh, workforce modernization or civilianization moving from what could classically be called the, the administrative roles towards more operational roles. And we can only do that then by looking at how we um, deliver the service, particularly, I would say, um, the front office. Um, where uh, we find that there are members there are performing duties which uh, Garda staff could perform. So any location where you're providing a 24-7 service obviously offers up uh, rich pickings, but we've picked um, you know, a wide range of areas for this year for exploration and delivery of workforce modernization, but really until we start getting into the service delivery positions, positions which don't require um, powers, but do require people on a 24-7 basis, that's where we'll really start to pick up the numbers. And uh, no later than Tuesday, we had a meeting just to clarify how we're going to go about that. Um, there's a census ongoing in the organization, which will report uh, by the end of next week on where everyone is and what they're doing. And then from that census, then site visits then to follow through uh, to make sure we have people in the right place and what further posts then are ripe for modernization or civilianization. So it is, it, um, it is ambitious. Our moving out of the comfort zone about, about where um, our Garda staff colleagues have been traditionally, but that's what's required to our office when we're moving towards a, a, an overall workforce of, of 4,000. You know, we aren't going to employ 4,000 clerical officers they have to take on um, roles which are closely aligned to service delivery as well. It struck me, and uh, some of my friends have said to me, my God, there's a lot more visibility of policing uh, out and about, whether it's checkpoints or on the beach. And so when I ask, is that a fact? Or is that just our perception? Uh, I hope it is a fact. And is the redeployment helping in that regard? Um, well, I'll take it as a fact. And... Uh, <laughs> but, but redeployment will help in that way. But uh, I say there's, there's two parts to redeployment. Uh, there's an element of the visible frontline policing that people would see, but frontline also includes um, intelligence work, detective work. Um, there's a lot of crime happens in a private place as opposed to the public place, and one thinks of, of cyber crime or domestic abuse, child abuse, etc. And these are areas there we also have to concentrate. But um, in terms of bringing people into the organisation, we'll, we'll have a net increase of 300 members this year, but also then if we achieve that redeployment of 500, that's a further 500 yeah. members who will go directly to okay. uh, duties which, re which will require uh, warranted powers. So that will increase visibility, and we do take the, the visibility piece of, of uh, our service delivery very seriously. Okay, well that, that's good news. I also noticed in the report that you have 15 uniformed so without going into too much detail, 15 uniformed members overseas. And I was just wondering, is that, are they mostly uh, members that you have in peacekeeping duties, like in, I know, in Cyprus, you have some people in Cyprus. Is that that category um, mainly? Uh, yes, and also um, our, our liaison officers, um, mainly based in Europe. Uh, there is the intention actually to increase that. We would like to increase our footprint of liaison officers uh, right across the world. Uh, certainly into um, America, both uh, south and north America, but also then into the Far East. And, and that's essential whenever we're trying to combat large-scale uh, international fraud. Um, there's, okay. it's, uh, and also then combat large-scale organized crime gangs, uh, which have an international reach and is very effective implement. So we want to extend that. So that number, we hope, and, and uh, will increase and indeed our duties with, uh, with the UN, they're very positive duties, and the individuals who come back from that, uh, it, it, is, it, it always has a positive uh, impact on them. It's a great development opportunity, but also our involvement is very much appreciated throughout the world. So that's something we wish to see grow as well.
Yeah, and I certainly very much welcome and support that. It does seem a very small number, though, to have with the United Nations. You know, if you compare the Defence Force, I think it's 600, you know, over many, many years, and it's made a huge impact both on their performance, the reputation, the reputation of the country. So, uh, so I would welcome, certain, I personally would welcome uh, your ambition to grow that number, but I think it could be grown significantly. You know, 10 is not whatever it is. Uh, is no. it mainly Cyprus? Is it you have the uh, Cyprus, but also the Balkans and right. um, uh, in investigating crimes against humanity in, in the yeah. Balkans in support of those. So, you know, uh, very important, but also very traumatic work as well. But you know, I and the organisation is fully committed to, you know, make yeah. sure we, we play our full part in supporting um, the UN missions and also then, you know, promoting the organisation and the state yeah. abroad. But also, uh, there's a direct benefit for the organisation oh, yeah. itself. Yes. Because they come back with more experience. There is, is, is so okay. So I'm glad we'll leave that yeah. then, uh, and we'll certainly monitor that and look forward to uh, to good news on that. Maybe moving on to the guard the reserves and the strategy is due to be developed in quarter two. That's and correct. I see from your report that the recruitment is 100 in quarter one. I just wonder, is, is that is that okay? Is there any misalignment? between the strategy and the recruitment, will it cause you any problems if the training has to be different, or are you comfortable with that? Um, we're on track in terms of that recruitment. Um, the training, which will need to be delivered, will change uh, when we uh, deliver um, on the strategy. Um, the strategy is in the, it's presently been formulated, but we do envisage that um, we wish to... In, in, clarify their role and then provide okay. them um, the necessary training and tools to, to do that role. So, you know, determine what actually their duties are going to be okay. uh, and, and uh, codify that for the organisation and then give them the skills and training which back that up. And also then, for individuals who volunteer, it's clear to them what is expected of them. And, and in some ways it's a two-way street because you know, we need people at the busy times and we, seek, and we want to be clear to volunteers that's what we'll expect of them. Okay. Well, we very much welcome the 100 uh, coming in, and that's on track, that's good. Uh, just another stat I noticed in your report, and that was sick leave, and you had an interesting statistic for the 31st of January uh, 2019, and by my calculations anyway, it was 5% of the both civilian, sorry, don't use that anymore, staff and uniformed were sick on that day. And as I understand it from others, from deeper uh, publications, the average sick percentage leave is, now that was across a year, was 4%. Now, is that a massive difference? Uh, I suppose my question is, is that something you monitor? And uh, if, if it becomes greater than the public sector average sick leave, is it something you'll be concerned about? Um, well, I, I, it is obviously something to be concerned about. Uh, we do monitor it. Um, we want to be sure that our supervisors, particularly at uh, frontline supervisors, are, are one, staying connected to individuals who avail sick leave, but secondly then um, are um, uh, conducting the uh, return to work interviews that one would expect, you know, speaking to the ind individual and uh, trying to assess uh, what has happened and then seeing then is a referral necessary to um, our, okay. our welfare services. So th that's ongoing. but. As you say, 617 uh, yeah. representing that figure, that, that's a loss of productivity to us, yeah. so it is, an, it is an obvious area of concern. Okay. Let's move on to ICT, and we welcome the initiatives, or the update on the initiatives uh, in, the, in your report. And there's some big ones there, investigations and management systems, frontline mobility, and there's three or four other ones. I suppose my question, not so much on them, but uh, on an ICT strategy. I, I know that your existing strategy is either out of date or will be soon out of date and uh, so the development of a new ICT strategy I think is very very important from the point of view of where you're going to go with ICT going forward and are you going to go with integrated or standalone systems bespoke or out of the box or something that other police services are using I suppose uh, policies around procurement and then around in-house expertise or uh, reliance on external consultants so the ICT strategy, I suppose all you want to know is, is that on your agenda and when would we expect to see it? Um, I had a presentation on um, the ICT strategy that's being drafted at, at the moment, well, it, and it looked pretty complete to me. That was a few weeks ago. It has to go for your own governance. When that happens, then we'll share it with you. And, uh, okay. 
Okay, well, we'll I'll, I'll, I'll not hold myself to a date, but it can't be too far off because the product I saw was looked to be complete. Um, okay. But we'll take into account your feedback specifically there okay. about um, procurement and in-house specialists as okay. opposed to um, outside, outside okay. contractors. Okay, I'll go on to a topic dear to all our hearts, the uh, Code of Ethics. Yes. And I might touch on culture as well. Um, I just noticed in your report for the first time you didn't have the stats in on the people who had trained, got the training, and the people who had signed up to abide by the code. Um, I think maybe until it's all done, we'd welcome if, if you could include that in future monthly reports. And uh, maybe, maybe you don't know, maybe some of your team know what the current stats are. Sorry, that's an oversight on my part. And actually, uh, um, I saw them today, and I just can't remember what document I read. Is it moving uh, in the right direction? Minute, yeah, so um, it is moving in the right direction. There been further interventions in terms of personal message from yeah. myself, but also then we're releasing um, a video as well. Um, but it continues to be a requirement if you seek um, promotion uh, in the organization or indeed seek uh, to move to uh, specialism, and obviously then um, other new members joining as well are required to sign the Code of okay. Ethics. So that carries on. Uh, we've had ongoing engagement um, with the associations um, in respect of that, okay. and that's ongoing. Probably hasn't borne the fruit that I might have hoped, um, okay. but at the same time, I think that's still worthwhile. Uh, in terms of I, know you I, I would like them to put their shoulder behind the wheel around this yeah. as well. well. That's good. I know you've communicated with, uh, with your members as well on, yeah. on the issue, which is good. Can I just maybe ask you something on culture? I was hoping that I would have seen a heading uh, on culture in, your, in the report. It is such a big challenge, uh, probably the biggest challenge you have probably, um, to achieve the culture you want to achieve in, in your five years. And uh, the culture audit, as I've said before, as we all know, was May last year. So I suppose the question I've asked before, sorry for repeating it, now where are you? in developing a plan to implement the culture that you wanted to achieve to address suppose, the shortcomings uh, identified by your own people in the audit and then you identifying the culture you wanted to, which you have articulated but not in writing yet, and then uh, to develop a plan that everybody can quite clear on the journey you're going to go on. Uh, so um, I can provide a report um, in respect to this matter because we have taken actions in this quarter around um, particularly employee engagement uh, and also then other areas that were um, picked up in the, in the cultural audit. So if I can provide a report to okay. you and then um, we, I can get your feedback on that. But work has happened um, and uh, we want to just accelerate yeah. uh, the change that the cultural audit asks for. I think it, it asks for physical, it asks for actual actions and, and that's what I want to do. So if, if I submit a report to you, then you can see then where good, we yeah. are with it. I know, and you have said before, you know, uh, actions can speak louder than words, which is true. Uh, but I think having both, and we recognise your actions, but uh, having both would be useful. Uh, just moving on maybe to a state, and uh, it's great to see the improvements in 2019. And there's a reference to public-private partnerships. And uh, is that a strategy? I know Joe isn't here, sorry. Is that a strategy you might use more of uh, to achieve success and do things faster, public-private partnerships? Um, I think, I, I, in some ways, I, I'm, I'm at the gift of um, those who hold the purse strings, respect yeah. to this, about what strategy actually okay. uh, works best. Um, and all, we are under considerable pressure uh, in the organisation around um, our estate overall. Like we, we are a grown organisation, and if you think yeah. uh, each member requires uh, even a locker, but yeah. certainly then um, uh, the guard of staff often require a desk, and yeah. there's a, you know accommodation issues are just keep on multiplying up for us. So these these um, new stations will relieve pressure around buildings which are frankly no longer yeah. fit for purpose. Um, but the, the arrival of the new guard of facility at Military Road will also create some challenges for us okay. because we will try to fit a quart into a pint pot and, and yeah. uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to have a pretty aggressive plan about how we use our accommodation, particularly in a greater Dublin area, over the next couple of years. And it's very important, uh, I think, for your members, both uniformed and staff, to be working in a, a comfortable environment. I do notice from the estimates that the... Uh, the budget has gone from, which is good, 13.6 million to 21.5 million. 
it's probably still not a huge money, but is it enough, I presume it is enough to achieve what you want to achieve in 2019? Um, I probably take that as a yes. Um, I did notice one thing though, when I was looking at the estimates, if I got this right, the uniform, the clothing spend is down from 8 million to 6 million. I thought, I was expecting to see that go up, because there's a new uniform coming out, isn't there, this year? Uh, well, uh, that takes into account what we think the reasonable procurement of that's going to be, so we have the most cost-effective uh, procurement of okay. it. And um, so the, the Uniform Committee uh, will report next month on that, um, and then we'll enter into the procurement process for it. But um, the more cost-effective okay. procurement takes a little longer, so in effect we're only replacing what well, uh, absolutely needs to be replaced and trying to run down the, the present stock and, and present Can uniform okay. stock so that we then It's not all going purchase. to happen this year. It's not no. all going to happen this year. Okay. Well, it, it, it may start at the very tail end of the year, okay. but even that would be quite ambitious thinking about a six months procurement okay. arrangement. Sorry, one maybe. final question. My colleagues might have questions. Um, a good piece on corporate communications, uh, how you're, you know, communication with the public. Are there any particular initiatives in communication with your own people? that you, because uh, it is your biggest challenge. One, in driving culture, probably communication is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, is there any initiatives uh, in relation to communication with your own people? Uh, well, we are very concerned, or are very aware of our internal communications. Um, and I'll just make a very small point. All our external communications is taken very seriously by our yes. internal audience, and sometimes yeah. you take that more seriously right. yeah. because yeah. you've said it in public. Um, yeah. So even beyond that, then, we are employing a specific individual to help with internal communications. Uh, we have a big piece of work to do around um, the Commission of Future Policing and the changes there, and not least then the changes around uh, the divisional project, etc. So it, we, we have an awareness there that the organisation wants a lot of information but what's going to happen, but even things like um, if we change the promotion process, what that's going to look like. Okay, and do you like to comment on any of the successes which are included in your report yourself, maybe over a few minutes, and then hand back to the Chair. Okay, thank you. Well, if, if I might just um, highlight that after our last public appearance where we talked about um, the juvenile referral and what had happened there, there's a very significant amount of work that's gone in in the last... Um, five, six weeks in terms of contacting victims, uh, either by letter or indeed um, in person, uh, establishing contact with them, but also then we ran the helpline um, for a month following the public meeting and we received, um, we received 35 relevant calls and uh, 16 emails. So the explanations that seem to be provided in public through this means and um, through coverage, etc., does seem to have been sufficient to allay people's concerns. And in the letter process, and, and thousands of victims by now have received their letters. Has, we haven't got, we haven't had a huge response in in respect of that. We have provided you with an interim report. By the next authority meeting, then the full report will be completed, and um, we'll have a, and the examination of that. Um, by an outside body is also complete and I'm pleased to report that um, they have given that a clean bill of health as a comprehensive uh, piece of work. The matter of individual accountability carries on. Um, the figure uh, when I take into account cessations is the actions of th at this moment is of 3,230 members are being uh, considered in respect of a consideration as well as a, uh, um, a discipline uh, culpability in respect of any of those that's carried on. It's done on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis by chief superintendents, the divisional officers, as the regulations state. Um, work's also carried on a pace around the Commission of Future Policing in, term, in line with our 2019 uh, implementation plan. Uh, this was launched in mid-December, and already we have senior managers in place, and work is going on in terms of um, improving uh, our IT, ICT systems, new investigation management systems, uh, and, and a fresh look at our discipline processes, and uh, most importantly, then local policing uh, delivery and internal systems um, uh, around human rights, uh, culture, performance, and uh, com continuous professional development. Um, operationally, there's been some uh, very significant work carried on, as one would expect. Um, big anti-gangland operation with our colleagues in the UK's NCA, National Crime Agency, the seizure of cannabis of 
at 950,000 euro value. I think that was 49 kilos of, of cannabis at, at Drogheda and arrests for burglary by local units right across the country. And also the report details in some detail community engagement activities, including warning older persons of the risks of rogue traders following uh, a number, number of incidents around the country, and also engaging with young people, communities and industry, important issues such as cyberbullying and online safety as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Pat. Just before we move on, I know there were some people coming here. To be sure you could see the receipts, because um, we're in a smaller space than usual today. And I, I just, uh, um, some of my colleagues have some questions. I know Judith has a question and Valerie has, so Judith. Thanks, Chair. I wanted to go back to Pat's observations about guard visibility, and uh, notwithstanding all the work that has been done around releasing police officers from administrative type duties to the front end and to visible policing roles. The findings of the public attitude survey would suggest that um, the public's awareness of Garda patrols locally and Garda presence locally has remained fairly stable. Uh, and in addition to that, there are some other findings in the public attitude survey around uh, the perception of fairness and equality of treatment and um, the perception of community relations with the police being poor, you know, very significant pr proportions of the public saying, in fact, 36% of respondents saying that community relations with the police are poor. So I wanted to ask a broad question, notwithstanding all the very positive things in the public attitude survey, to what extent does the public attitude survey drive strategy and poli policy and tactical action on the ground? Because there's so much rich information in it. How does it inform? how you deploy your resources and, and your response to the findings of the strategy? Well, yes, well, well there, there are areas um, in the survey which obviously we're very pleased about, but those areas that, you, that, um, that you've highlighted are areas of concern for us. And uh, I would say that uh, when we think about our community engagement in its widest sense, so how we um, not only work with other partners, um, statutory partners and, and in the voluntary sector, but also how we engage with local communities. We are given a completely a new refresh to see what more we can do. Like that, in some ways, that is quite negative feedback, and it's not how we perceive ourselves, and it's not really um, acceptable to us that th those percentages should sit, should sit so low. We want to drive some of this through the new divisional model, where we um, improve community policing delivery of a framework around community uh, engagement, but also then specific neighbourhood policing, uh, where that is the appropriate um, mode of delivery. Um, so that's, that is of concern. Second part in respect of visibility, um, again, there's a big responsibility on all of us on this side of the table to drive forward to this workforce modernisation that will reap benefits in terms of overall service delivery, additional resources to the front line, and in part that will be you know, visible uh, placing on, on the ground. A specific place as, as well, you know, like it has to be informed. You know, we need to be in the right places operationally for deployment as well, where there's a need for us to be too. So um, those, those, the, those couple of stats are of concern. We do talk about them, think what next we can do uh, operationally to, to improve on those. And is that understood by commanders on the ground, not just at the command team level, but also by well, district and divisional you know, officers? Whenever we meet with the chief superintendents, and we meet again with the chief superintendent, divisional commander, and district officer superintendent cadre, you know, a specific area of conversation and a topic for discussion presentation is about the survey and where it's going, what the trends are, and what we should be doing to improve that. So it, it is a matter addressed by the management. Sorry. As late as yesterday, we have provided that information to our uh, regional commanders, the detailed breakdown, uh, and what, the, what their findings are from a regional perspective, and that will feed into uh, the deployment of personnel to address the issues. But I think it is, it is important that when we look at 2018 over 2017, there have been lots of improvements, there have, there have been lots of great work which has been done, and that then gives us the opportunity to look at the areas where for that, for that continuous improvement. But the information out of the public attitude survey drives operational deployment. Thank you. Valerie? 
Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up. A, first of all, thank you again for the report. And I think for anybody watching or listening, it's, it's well worth reading the report. And I think it'll be put up online. Um, I wanted to just note appreciation for the presentation of the crime stats. You've given us three-year trends, uh, which I, I think is, is, is a useful way of presenting the data. And given that we're around three years, I suppose it's, it's particularly interesting for us. I was wondering, would you like to offer any commentary on the trends in terms of crimes against the person and crimes against property? And actually, while you're, while you're thinking about that, just coming back to the visibility piece, somebody else mentioned to me recently that it's great to see more cars around, so some people are noticing it, but also said, would they stop and get out of the cars and introduce themselves now and again? So I'll just leave that <laughs> one with you. <laughs> Okay. But I think that, that personal relationship in communities can be important. Um, it, it's, it's really just your, your commentary on the direction of crime and your role in crime prevention. Um, have so, you any comment on it, really? So um, what, what we can see um, is some of the crimes that one classifies dishonesty, the acquisition of property, are, are, that is on, is on a, lot, um, a, a decline. Um, over a five-year period, particularly over, let's say, the last um, three years, and that reflects I think, patterns right across um, Europe and certainly in our nearest neighbour. Uh, and again, actually, uh, total crimes against the person and their, you know, steady um, uh, incline. It, it's, it looks like a shallow incline, but it is certainly increasing year on year. That also reflects patterns else, uh, um, elsewhere. Um, I, I would particularly. The crimes against the person there. Uh, I think an element of that is around um, things like crimes which hitherto have been very much underreported. So, particularly domestic abuse and um, serious sexual assault type crimes. There is certainly um, in this jurisdiction, as in other jurisdictions, a steady uptick in that. And I know later on in the meeting we want to talk about protective um, services units and yes. that we wish to roll out. And, and that w once you know once we establish units and they establish their connections with uh, the various um, bodies engaged in in, in uh, uh, such as women's aid etc um, then that'll that'll uptick further you know once you once you establish something you'll see more domestic abuse probably and, that, and that's a good thing in terms of the, the reporting to us like we, we want to increase reporting there yes okay. um, so our our patterns aren't particularly unusual, but they they give us they tell us something about how we need to equip ourselves, you know, not only this year but you know three to five years out. If these trends continue, that that tells us what sort of investigators we need in the organisation and how best then, and even what our equipment profile should be in terms of the skills that we're looking for individuals. So they they're not only you know they're not just of the moment, but they're important sort of <coughs> planning indicators. For, for three to five years out around the composition of our workforce as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Valerie. Um, Commissioner, um, just two questions. Sorry, anybody else want to before we move on? Paul, please. Can I just ask one question, Commissioner, in relation to the Code of Ethics issue? Yes. I know it's already been raised, but you mentioned in the report the mop up workshops that have been taking place in 2019. Thus far, can you just provide a little bit more detail about those workshops, how many there have been, um, and are there plans to continue with that throughout the course of the year? Uh, well, um, I can't give you this precise statistic, but the, the plan is actually that, that in totality the whole organisation will have been through a workshop. So um, it, it, uh, it, it was big effort in 2018 and, and it's described as a mop-up. Uh, we can't be very far off finishing that now. I can supply, I know we're, we're well above 10,000. I think we must be pushing up into about 14,000. So in an organisation this size, you know, we are, we're, we're, we're getting to the very I tail end. I, I think the intention is that by the end of Q2 we'll have the entire organisation finished. So that will be members who have attended yes. the workshops and then presumably there will still be a shortfall between those who have attended and those who have signed the that's, code? That, that's so correct. We're in, we're in the high, mid, mid to high 8,000s in terms of those who have signed at this moment in time. So there presumably will have to be some thinking about what happens to the number of individuals who perhaps don't end up signing the code? Well, um, and we haven't given thought to that and I have uh, um, resisted just um, 
a, a direction, you know, just, you know, in effect, an order to sign. I think this is better that it's done through um, persuasion um, and negotiation. And, and that's why we've been um, speaking with the staff associations in respect of this, but also um, promoting the code of ethics as well, the sales. There's no gaps in terms of signature in, in any of the, man, you know, the higher management ranks, all superintendents, chief superintendents, and, and executive level have signed up the code of ethics. And indeed, if you want to really move in the organization now, you need to have signed the code of ethics. And we just want to keep just narrowing down that number and, and uh, chip away at it. Um, we've talked about the message already going out, and then that has to be followed up then by a video. And, and we'll just keep on going at it. The, the code of ethics is important to us, and it is important to us in terms of also picking up the, the human rights agenda as well throughout the year. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, and your intervention has reminded me that I miss my manners. Uh, obviously, in our private session, we welcomed our two new members to the authority, but I didn't. I think I should publicly acknowledge the arrival of Paul McGeehan and the re-arrival of Vicky Conway as members of the authority. This is their first meeting uh, as new members of the authority, and uh, I, I should have done that at the beginning, so apologies for that. Um, you, quick question for me, uh, Commissioner. I, reading the uh, report about the estate, not that I don't want to talk about the estate, but it reminded me because there's a reference in there to stock. To um, There's a stock strategy due, which we were planning to have back at the authority. Isn't that correct? That's the Special Tactic and Operations yeah. Command. We had a preliminary engagement, and, and we were... The action point from that, I recall was that we were going to revisit it when you were finished. My memory is correct. And how are you getting on? Um, yeah, the, the strategy is coming uh, and the revised policy is coming to a conclusion. So I ex expect that, um, that there, there is an estate piece to this as well and that's a relocation to happen yeah, on I saw the that. 8th or 11th of March. Uh, and the policy will, will be there to, to, to roll out immediately after that. So I would expect in the, in the next couple of weeks we will be able to provide that strategy to then you. Then we'll, so we'll put it on a future agenda, yeah, yes, as, we, as we yeah, said yeah. we would. Thank you for that. Um, <coughs> the next item on our agenda relates to the expansion of the protective services units, as Commissioner referenced. Uh, and this is um, a hugely positive development that's been coming along incrementally over the last number of years, and you recently added... Uh, some additional units. So we thought it would be an opportunity to ask how, how they're doing and how the expansion and then your plans ahead. And that's going to be led for us by, by Vicky. Um, Commissioner, the protective services units obviously were piloted initially in 2017 and then recently um, expanded. And I want to go through a number of um, dimensions of that, but perhaps just for clarity of those watching, you might um, initially like to outline what the protective services units are and how they function. Uh, turn to John, please. Okay, well, uh, people are well aware, I suppose, at this stage that we have a Garda National Protective Services Bureau at the centre, which comes under my command, Special Crime Operations. Uh, and while that performs a very important function in relation to the investigation of a whole range of crime, particularly involving vulnerable victims, and having oversight in relation to crime of particular nature throughout the, or uh, throughout the country, uh, it was deemed necessary to have uh, a much greater focus on, on those particular crimes at a local level uh, where there is uh, you know, victims who are particularly vulnerable. So uh, a decision was made to uh, have a minimum of one uh, di divisional protective services unit within each division. So those units uh, will take on a range of um, the investigation of a range of crime, uh, dealing with domestic issues, dealing with uh, a whole range of uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, then the, those units, uh, we, well, we decided to start with four units as a pilot, uh, and four divisions, uh, three divisions were chosen. Uh, Dublin West being particularly busy, we put place two units within that one division, and then we had one in Loud and uh, Cork also. Uh, an additional six units um, became operational in the first week in January, and the plan is uh, that uh, more will be commissioned in the beginning of, or in the month of May, uh, an additional number in August, and then uh, by the end of December,
December, all going well, we would hope to have a minimum of one such unit in, in every division. Uh, following the um, first four units being operational for a number of months, uh, we undertook uh, an examination of how they were operating uh, and have since taken on board some of the lessons learned, uh, firstly before we commissioned the next six which opened in January and, and we're taking the lessons from the first ten then on board before we uh, commission any more. But uh, issues such as the um, extent uh, the remit of those units have been raised by the personnel involved. Uh, and so we've had to uh, review, uh, you know, uh, and to make, to introduce clarity into what specifically is their remit. Uh, in some instances, they believed that it was too broad and that their uh, capacity was stretched. Uh, and so where you take a crime category such as, say, human trafficking, which involves very vulnerable people, uh, it is beyond their capacity to take on very significant human trafficking investigations. Uh, so where you will have, say, within a division, uh, a senior investigating officer investigating an incident of human trafficking, uh, what is, will be expected of the, the Divisional Protective Services Unit is that there will be personnel within that unit who will have received uh, particular training uh, and will have particular expertise who will be part of the investigation team. Uh, but a whole unit could be taken up with uh, investigating one particular incident, for example, in that okay. area if, they, if only personnel attached to a, a, a unit of that nature was to investigate crime. Uh, so can I ask, what are the size of these units? Well, what we're aiming at is that uh, we will have an inspector, two sergeants, and ten guardi, uh, and uh, a number of um, uh, guard staff then supporting them. Uh, and that is the, the target in terms of a minimum uh, as they uh, commence operation. Now, sometimes it takes a bit longer to get all the cogs of the wheel working together, so. Uh, a unit may open while we're awaiting the result of a competition, say, to bring in all the uh, the guard staff, or there may be a competition in place for sergeants. So it, it takes a little uh, bit of time to get them all up to that level. But where a division uh, is larger, or where the, uh, the experience of the particular crimes that they will deal with uh, is uh, more extensive, uh, we will have a greater number of people. So if you take Dublin West, where we have two units within that division, uh, and Paul was in charge of them for a while, so it's about uh, four and maybe 30 to 35 guards uh, in, in that particular division. Uh, and there will be a number of divisions, and we've already identified divisions that will have a larger number of personnel. But typically around the country, uh, um, resourcing in the range of one inspector, two sergeants, ten guardi, and a uh, number of uh, guard staff. Uh, okay. Be, um, I'd like to ask a few questions about the examination that was conducted, because obviously with any new initiative like this, uh, which is really commendable and has um, fantastic um, intention, um, evaluating that properly and seeing, learning from it, as you said, is really important. What was the methodology of the evaluation that was conducted? Well, the... the Personnel attached to the four units were interviewed, uh, so there were personnel at, at each rank, but also the senior management within the divisions where they were operating, so chief superintendents and superintendent, the detective superintendent in particular, uh, and then the personnel attached to the Garda National Protective Services Bureau uh, were interviewed also. Uh, were any the, external agencies or victims spoken to as part of that? Uh, no, victims uh, weren't spoken to in that initial phase, but if, if they have produced one report arising from an examination of the, of the first four units, but further research will be uh, conducted as time progresses. And uh, obviously, now that we have 10 units in place, I think it offers a better prospect of, of achieving meaningful information arising from the examination that will be done. But most certainly, the uh, um, uh, outcome in terms of uh, interactions with victims will be a particular focus as we go forward to ensure that, that 
it's not just a case where we believe we have a, a better quality of service, but that the victims are experiencing that improved. Service. Yeah, I would think that speaking like agencies like Women's Aid and the Rape Crisis Centres, and because I have heard quite positive things from them, but That's I think true. engaging with them in a strategic way would be very important. What were the criteria used for that evaluation? Well, the, first of all, the, as I say, the Guard Research Unit had only a short period of time to uh, undertake the research uh, before we were due to commission uh, additional units. So they basically uh, undertook an examination of the, the, or an interviewing of those people who were already assigned to the existing units. But the numbers were particularly small, obviously, because there were only four units. So. Uh, and then they interviewed them in relation to a range of uh, issues such as the resourcing, uh, the, uh, the, the nature of the crimes that they were expected to investigate and the interaction with the hub at the centre, that is the Garda National Protective Services Bureau. Uh, and th that was the main focus in terms of uh, uh, establishing what the lessons that should be learned before uh, we would advance to opening additional units. And presumably, if, uh, given that it's being rolled out further, there were positive findings from that evaluation. What, what successes were identified? Well, the, the, there is positivity in terms of, for example, uh, uh, and while the research itself may not have explored in terms of engaging with other agencies, uh, aside from that, we would be aware, from exam for example, that uh, uh, the DPP's office would have expressed uh, a view that there, were, uh, there was an improvement in, in the nature of files that were being submitted uh, uh, as a consequence of investigations undertaken by the, by the staff uh, assigned to the units uh, and uh, the interaction uh, with uh, uh, and, and the speed at which uh, victims were dealt with was, was positive. The, the personnel attached to the units had a very positive uh, uh, response and felt that they were receiving better training and better support, particularly from the National Unit, the Garden National Protective Services Bureau. But they did uh, express um, concern about the extent of the work which was assigned to them. Uh, they were concerned uh, about, you know, the usual resource issues, but nothing really different to that which you would hear from other units, for example, the availability of vehicles. Uh, the, uh, and, and you know, the accommodation that's, that is provided. But that is, these are issues clearly which if you interviewed any personnel throughout the organisation, uh, they would have concerns. And clearly, uh, while it is desirable that they are resourced to the extent that we would like to ultimately have them resourced, uh, they, like every other unit, uh, will, will uh, uh, receive the additional resources in, in an incremental fashion but as soon as they can be delivered. And as the various competitions are taking place, whether it be for Garda staff or you know, more recently we had uh, promotions and will again very shortly have additional sergeants uh, appointed, that helps greatly in ensuring that the units are resourced uh, appropriately uh, and in a, a manner which will ensure that they can, they can each, each unit can fulfil uh, the role that, that it is intended that they will fulfil. Uh, and obviously, uh, Fulfilling our obligations on the, under the Victims Directive uh, is important uh, and when you have a, a better organisation at a local level uh, in terms of interaction with victims, uh, it, it, you know, there's greater certainty that we will uh, achieve uh, our, our fulfil our obligations uh, under that directive uh, and uh, you know, our dealings with victims in general will improve greatly. Yeah, I mean, as you said, the, the issues that come within this, and the Commissioner has mentioned this already, often are areas where under-reporting of crimes is a really dominant factor um, in areas like sexual offences, domestic violence, child abuse, and so on, and human trafficking, as you've mentioned. Um, and the Commissioner made the link already to the hope that these would contribute to better reporting, and it's encouraging to hear that there's um, some initial evidence, um, which we'll track in the future, around um, speedier presentation of files to the DPP, which is obviously a huge issue for victims to see the case proceeding more quickly. Um, d is it an active hope that these units will contribute to increased detection rates because they've been quite poor in these areas in recent years? Well, invariably, uh, improved investigation files uh, leads to a greater prospect of, uh, of conviction.
convictions or prosecutions in the first instance and then ultimately convictions. Uh, clearly, uh, also a lot of these areas are very difficult in terms of prosecuting. It's not always uh, the fault, if there is fault, anywhere along the line of the personnel who are investigating uh, in achieving uh, um, a successful outcome to a prosecution. It has to be based on the evidence that is available. And there can be all sorts of uh, impediments and difficulties uh, along the way. But ultimately, uh, if one is to achieve uh, better results, uh, the better quality investigation files are uh, offered that prospect. You mentioned that one of the issues that arose in the evaluation was that question of, I suppose, scope and remit, um, the scale of the offences and the complexity of some, particular, some of them in particular um, that fall within these remits. Um, how is that being addressed going forward? As a result of the evaluation, are you making changes to how that proceeds in the new areas? Yeah, you know, we're certainly uh, examining uh, the, the workload that these units will be tasked with uh, handling. Uh, one of the repercussions, of course, of greater levels of reporting is uh, a greater burden in terms of a workload. Uh, and while uh, it is clearly uh, desirable that all victims come forward, uh, it, it, there is a limit to the capacity of individuals who, who are working long hours in many instances to, uh, to properly investigate crime. But we, we are investigating, and, and indeed the uh, at the moment, we are developing a, a document. It's almost uh, finalised within the Garden National Protective Services Bureau uh, to provide guidance in terms of how precisely uh, or what precise investigations are to be undertaken solely by a, a, a Division of Protective Services unit and, and other investigations where they will have an involvement in them but will not have sole responsibility for investigating them. But that also involves resourcing of um, detective units uh, and having sufficient people at, uh, trained, for example, as senior investigating officers. And, and as the additional personnel arrive into the organization, uh, and, you know, for example, in my own area in charge of special crime operations, it's in the last year in particular that we have uh, began to feel the, the result or experience the result of the increased recruiting uh, as we have got a share of, of that, those extra resources in the organisation. So as time moves forward, uh, clearly around the country, detective units are being better resourced. A uh, greater number of uh, um, personnel trained at senior investigating officer level. And all of that will help to, to ensure um, that, that there is proper resourcing uh, uh, or appropriate resourcing for undertaking investigations of, of the nature that we're talking about here. If there's updates around policy in relation to that, it would be great if you could share those with us, with us, as well as the evaluation report, which I think we asked for before, so it would be great to get that as well. Um, the one question then, particularly again with these crimes, which often are kind of escalate in nature, so an individual you know, may initially engage in course of control and that can build to very serious consequences as we know. Um, our you know, sexual violence can escalate as well within, the context, within a particular context. I'm wondering how these units, um, because you're talking about them very much in terms of investigative work, how are they feeding into crime prevention initiatives? Well, we, aside from their investigative role, uh, within the units they have uh, additional responsibilities in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the recording of particular types of crime uh, and uh, indeed in the Garden National Protective Service Bureau they have created a number of uh, key performance indicators uh, which are uh, um, circulated then throughout the divisions uh, uh, where we monitor uh, the results in, in relation to particular crime categories. Uh, and that, that is assisting in ensuring that, uh, that uh, detection rates, uh, you know, that there's a greater prospect of improving detection rates. Uh, and anywhere where there is you know, oversight at a, at a national level, uh, such as that exercised by the Garden Nest Protective Services Bureau, it helps to ensure uh, that there is a focus on, on, the, on detection rates as, as well as the, uh, the preventative aspect of crime. I cover the risk assessment tool. Yeah, and there is a, a risk assessment tool being developed, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, is uh, 
currently underway, uh, and we're hoping that it will be, you know, the, the outcome of it will, will be available in, in the near future. That's the uh, domestic violence risk assessment too. Yes, yes, and, and that's important because the, the, these units won't be able to go to every domestic um, abuse, domestic violence type incident. That's, you know, they're not staffed to, to provide that 24-7 um, response. So uniform guards are going to be attending incidents and they need to be able to uh, assess an incident. And to do that, we need to give them the tools to do that, but also then the understanding and training. And then beyond that, then we have to ensure delivery as well. So like that, that is not a simple piece of work, but it's absolutely essential in identifying not only just um, uh, the coercion element, but where we're seeing uh, vulnerability and uh, an escalation as well, so that then more specialist uh, members and officers then can intervene and provide the appropriate supports and also then a multi-agency response as well. So um, the risk assessment part of this um, is, is very important and, and uh, it's essential in terms of the workings of the, um, the District Protective Services units. So and the there response is an on the part, sorry, of a trench college in, in, in that development there. So the responding officers should use the yeah. risk assessment tool and then refer to the protective service unit as well, appropriate. Yeah, well, it, it, um, there's quite a bit in this because it requires an LinkedIn to pulse, um, and uh, it, it will require um, pretty major training operation as well, right across um, all our uniform members who maybe respond to this type of incident. And uh, you know, we, d we don't want to lose the opportunity to intervene. Um, we, uh, and uh, we, don't want to, we don't want to miss an opportunity which is, appears before us and we actually miss the warning signs. So like it, it's, um, it's an area of concentration, uh, I know for John, but it will also be a concentrate area of concentration for divisional and district officers going forward. Mm -hmm. And we, the personnel are receiving training there uh, at the moment in relation to the whole area of coercive control, uh, and um, that is that is actually taking place as we speak here, where we have yeah. one particular individual who is uh, here from the UK uh, and who is uh, providing us with uh, guidance in relation to how legislation similar to that which we have recently uh, enacted here uh, is, is operated. So, uh, clearly, as the Commissioner says, uh, the, the number of calls to domestic incidents is of such a nature that, again, the protective services units cannot be there 24-7, uh, so it, it will involve uh, personnel uh, out and about patrolling, going to calls, uh, make, having an initial contact, but the, the local protective services units will have a role in, in, in providing guidance, in providing monitoring, and then uh, at the uh, centre in the Garden National Protective Services Bureau, we'll be monitoring to make sure that, that those domestic incidents are being properly um, dealt with uh, and that uh, adequate attention is being given to that course of control uh, aspect of, of those uh, crimes. So are these units, they're not operating on a 24-7 basis, are they 9 to 5? Uh, well, they, they, mightn't, they won't be working 9 to 5, but they, they might, not, might not cover all 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, the numbers involved in any event, because typically a, a patrol car will get a call uh, and will, whoever is first available will go to an incident, so they may well be the first responder, but uh, as soon as possible thereafter we will have an involvement. Uh, and I suppose the important thing is that that the expertise uh, will be available or um, you know, sufficient knowledge will be available within a divisional setting uh, to, to ensure that, that people can, will have a, a resource to go to to understand how best to deal with scenarios where maybe in the past they might have been left alone to wonder how they should best deal uh, with some of the scenes that they uh, attend uh, where, which are domestic in nature. And are you satisfied that one protective service unit per division is, I mean, is that the ultimate aim? Are you satisfied that that will be sufficient access for these victims? Well, what, we, what we're aiming at is a minimum of one in each division, but already, and from the very outset, uh, we have two in one division. Uh, so we have clearly 
uh, recognise that there are particular divisions uh, where one unit uh, will not be sufficient, or at least the, the level of resourcing that I spoke about, the one inspector, two sergeants and, and ten guardy would not be sufficient, and that in fact, like Dublin West, almost double that would be necessary in, in a particular division, depending on the number of investigations involved. Uh, as far as I can recall, uh, and um, Paul can assist me there, but I think in a 12-month in period in Dublin West, uh, there was, they, they dealt with about 360 files uh, between the two units in that area. So it's a very extensive workload. Uh, but hopefully, and what we will be monitoring as time goes on, is that we had 360 files that were of a better quality than otherwise would have been the case had those investigations taken place uh, in the absence of, a, of protective services units and um, by personnel who may not have received the same training that is now being afforded to the personnel assigned to those uh, units. I think a question we would have going forward, and I appreciate you know, there were four pilots and, and you got what evidence you could from that, but as the numbers grow, I mean, it, it does seem these are very broadly stretched and they are vast crime areas that these are covering. Um, and I think we will be very interested in seeing future evaluations and seeing how that spreads and whether each of the crimes is getting the scale of attention um, that they require um, and whether that model can facilitate th the broad range. Um, I think that's something from future evaluations we'll be wanting to see. Indeed, and following the evaluation done by our research unit, the uh, head of bureau at the Garden of Protective Services Bureau uh, completed a report which he submitted to me outlining his view of uh, the issues raised and I, in recent days, have completed uh, um, a report which I'm submitting to uh, the Deputy Commissioner uh, where I've given consideration to all of the issues involved uh, and have uh, proposed uh, how we should operate into the future. But that will, the, the reflection on how the units are operating obviously will continue as more units become operational. Uh, and, you know, I think with 10 now operational, uh, we will have a, better source of information uh, to, to make firmer decisions as we go forward. And you're happy to share those evaluations as they're Absolutely, conducted? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to ask any supplementaries to uh, myself before I move on? Um, you mentioned the training, Assistant Commissioner. Is that training being dispersed nationally and made available nationally? And I. I, I ask this because I noted a media report today that um, a judge observed, made an observation about uncertainty uh, in the Garda regarding the new legislation in the context of a domestic violence family law case in your neck of the woods in well, West Cork. Th there is actually training uh, taking place in, in the Garda College at, at, at the moment. Uh, there, uh, I think in January there was training provided in the area of investigating uh, sexual offences and there are three other, three other model, uh, modules being delivered over uh, uh, at the moment and into um, April uh, covering domestic uh, issues, uh, domestic abuse issues and then there's training in relation to human trafficking and, and other crimes uh, involving vulnerable victims. So that has been delivered at the centre in Templemore as we speak. Uh, might be, it might be worth considering, when we met last month we talked about the, um, the rollout of the training using technology because certainly, and I'm not expecting you to be familiar with the case, I just happen to read the papers every morning um, in the bus. Um, so it's just, you know, it's new legislation and clearly there are members on the ground uh, having to interpret. It seemed to be a fairly, fairly basic fundamental and the judge observed that he understood fully uh, that it was new, but um, it, it was in a domestic situation. So I think it's kind of important that uh, certainty is available, at least on, on, on the fundamentals. And, but indeed, you know, as a person who has dealt with crime in a whole range of areas, it, it is actually those first cases stated that are most important uh, to understanding how best to investigate 
crimes uh, into the future uh, and a few initial cases uh, in that area can, can clarify issues for us uh, sure. and, uh, and those cases used then in future training. Yeah. I, I, I accept that indeed. Um, so thank you for that and uh, we'd, I'd now like to move on. Oh, I do have another question. I was going to keep it later but maybe it's more relevant now. Um, in 2014, the, the Guard Inspectorate recommended that a piece of work be done around domestic homicide. And that was included in the government strategy. In uh, the 2016 government strategy in relation to the prevention of domestic, sexual, and gender-based violence as an objective. The piece of work appeared in the policing plan in 17 and 18, and it doesn't seem to have advanced very far. So I was wondering whether you were in a position to give us any sense of whether that is still a live piece of work. But this is not. This is an analysis. This is not um, what's often referred to as a domestic homicide review, as happens in England and Wales. This is an analysis spanning a period of years that was committed to in the government strategy, um, and it has appeared in the policing plan, but but it has it hasn't yet uh, been delivered. So I wonder if you could give us some sense of where that is. Well, there are a number of personnel uh, within the Garden National Protective Services Bureau, a uh, small number, uh, I think it may be three, who are assigned to a, 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 a team who are looking at cases of this nature. Uh, and I know they have undertaken an examination of one particular case uh, as a, a pilot. There were two cases which uh, occurred in 2018 in respect of which I believe now because we have convictions uh, it makes it easier for us to review. Uh, so they, are, they have been identified uh, as two additional cases that we will examine. Uh, uh, further to that, uh, we have a situation where the review that has been undertaken by Chief Superintendent Sutton that you will uh, be aware of the outcome of the examination of the 41 cases yeah. involved in, in that particular exercise will be considered uh, also. Uh, and I think that will give us um, uh, a lot of work to do uh, and keep us fairly busy for a while in terms of, of exploring uh, what can be learned from uh, examining the, that cadre of cases. Uh, and as we go forward, uh, we will be identifying cases, additional cases, which are appropriate for, for review of that nature. Okay, well, we'll have a question or two later on the, the uh, broader homicide review. Um, and it's interesting that, that they're being connected. But it certainly, while some of the lessons are similar, I think there are aspects of, of domestic homicide in terms of harm reduction, prevention for future victims that are a bit different from your, dare I, you know, from, from homicides in general that probably do merit, and certainly that was the uh, expectation, as I understood it, of the government strategy in 2016, was that it would, there would be a piece of work that would identify what were the characteristics, particularly to help identify and prevent harm to perhaps future victims or subsequent victims and so on, uh, in a particular domestic context. But the, so there's a, there's, yeah, well, there is a limit um, to what we usually can do because we are a single agency looking at um, homicides where there often is multiple agencies mm -hmm. engaged. So I think what we would like to do is get our own review of these cases um, underway. We have, we, there, doubtless, there's lessons for us to learn and we, uh, we have to think of the governance process and we have a place to make sure those, those lessons are learned. But then there's something about just extending this further on into what is more widely regarded as a classic domestic homicide review where you have with all the relevant agencies sitting around the table in a learning exercise mm -hmm. to see what, what could have been done differently in terms mm -hmm. of intervention and indeed um, prevention. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we can't do that um, on our own. We are making a start. The, the other cases that have been under review by uh, Chief Superintendent Sutton that, there is learning there as well for us, so it would be foolish to miss that in terms of this domestic work. No, I think we'd agree with that, and certainly we, it's not our expectation that you can do that, that broader um, piece of work yourselves. It was just, this would be an important contribution if anyone was doing such a broader piece of work. So 
uh, we'll keep it on, on the agenda. Um, our next uh, agenda item is uh, an update on the um, Juvenile Diversion Programme as a follow-on to our meeting in January. Since then, we have received uh, your formal interim report, Commissioner, and um, thank you for that. There's a, there's a lot of information in it that's, that's helpful and helps to illustrate and fill in uh, some of the discussion that we had the last day. And our discussion on this is going to be led by, by Moling. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, at the outset, um, can I commend the uh, Commissioner for uh, the quality of the interim report that you received last, um, last Friday. Um, clarity, well, re um, well presented, well written, uh, reflective. Um, I think it's an excellent, really excellent report, and um, well done to everybody involved in it. Just, uh, just maybe by way of introduction, some reminder in relation to um, uh, the issue under discussion. First, we're talking about a um, period, seven-year period from 2010 to 2017, where there were 158,521 youth referrals relating to uh, over 57,000 children, created an impulsive an average of over 22,000 cases per year. Um, if I might maybe just um, remind ourselves of what the significant issue that we were de is dealing with here, and if I leave aside to one, uh, to, to, um, uh, for a moment the issue of uh, the referral to juvenile liaison officer and the issue of um, cases remaining in draft form. But what we're, what we're talking about here are um, 3,549 children associated with 7,961 youth referrals. And in the, in the words of, um, of your interim report, um, you say, as a consequence, there are 3,549 children who were suspected of having committed a criminal offence and received no sanction or intervention. And there was little evidence on the pulse system to suggest that each child or their parents' guardians were kept informed on the status of the case. And this failure could potentially have had a psychological impact on some children. We have anxiously waited for guardian to engage with them. While for others, the lack of follow-up or sanction may have fueled a perception of immunity leading to the commission of further offences. It also occurs to me that um, out of this, um, uh, there's quite clear impact on the credibility of the Guardi, notably the numbers involved in the fact that it had an impact at a national level. And the authority notes um, the apology from uh, the commissioner in a number of fora, which I think was well received and appropriate. But a number of matters occurred to me, if I may raise them with you. If I may raise the first one of monitoring and evaluation uh, um, in, relation to, um, in relation to the programme. My looking at the report suggests that there were quite a number of levels of monitoring. We firstly had the monitoring committee in place since 2003, who had specific legislative responsibility to monitor the effectiveness of the program, but seems to have had confined itself really to just reporting on the figures. In the Garda Youth Diversion Office, you had responsibility for the management of the program. You had internal audit who conducted four audits, but largely on health and safety and finance. You had senior, manage, senior management, from my recollection in the, in, the, in, the, in, the report, in the report itself, there was, a, there was a reference that senior guard members and probation guard had a poor understanding of the youth referral system. And then there was a modest number of just J8 JLO sergeants. Now, I think this, this, has, this is a specific concern in relation to this program, but for myself, I have concern in relation to the potential of the extension of that rather flimsy monitoring and evaluation of a significant programme across other areas of guard activity. And I'd certainly appreciate a comment from you on that. Um, well, that, that, that is a, a question that we face now here and, and uh, direct us as well. Um, this process, we can go back to 2010 because all juvenile referrals were subject to, um, or all juveniles were subject to a, a unique referral. Um, 
And you do point out that this did go on for an ordinate length of time, and in fact actually was repaired by Pulse 6.8, which was in reply to uh, the inspector's report of 2014. That's why that intervention was made. And even before really the inspection work into this commenced, or our own work into this commenced, by and large we, we had plugged this particular gap in providing a feedback loop uh, and, and made the changes. So there was a systems failure here um, uh, with, without a doubt. The difficulty for us is we can't recreate you know, 2010 or 2011 in respect of, of uh, uh, adult offenders. What we do know is that 6.8 and then 7.3 and then coupled with the improvements to our own computer aided dispatch, which are five, six rolled out now, and then the forthcoming introduction of the, of the um, investigation management system will give us assurance that we didn't have um, seven, eight years ago, uh, and that's a fact, but neither can we we recreate what adults we were interacting with and those of which should have been prosecuted and, and subsequently weren't. And I, you know, I'm not in a position to give an assurance on that um, or have information which would assure the, the, assure the authority. I, I can say, really, I can't look back into that because at least with the juveniles, the records exist. Those same records don't exist with the adults. My concern, obviously, is, is that the evaluation took place um, and this is an ev a very effective evaluation, but just took place after a very critical report. So it was just, it was really when, when, the, when the significant problem that there was, was, was identified, even though it was identified first in 2014, and maybe slightly before, um, but, but it, 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 it was in response to that that, that eventually we, have, uh, we now have this evaluation. And it, 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 it's, a concern, it's a concern for me and for the authority that where there are significant programming elements undertaken by the Guardian, or whatever, hey, mm -hmm. uh, my concern is the absence of structured evaluation. And I would, I, yeah. I, I, you, if you might take that in the general, and then in the particular, I would be interested in, 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 um, in, in uh, you letting me know whether or not there has been an evaluation of the effectiveness of the entire youth diversion program. Um, so beyond that, those who successfully move through the programme and are dealt with the programme, uh, that there are statistics in terms of uh, offending or yeah. indeed um, not, not uh, re-offending, um, and those are available. Uh, do you have those? Well, two-thirds two successfully move through that programme and, and don't engage in terms of, of re-offending behaviour. But... Um, and, and, the, and the program is well regarded. I, I, I'll, I will have to look to see just what we have, which, which gives us the comfort about the, the actual utility and success of it. But you know, a, a figure of two thirds yep. not reoffending is a very positive yep. figure. I have, I have no reason to disagree with your assessment of of, of the success. Um, I think I'm just the reliance the reliance over the last number of years in relation to this program has been on that issue on statistics and yet when the statistics were interrogated we find that there were you know there were there were various matters that weren't being addressed okay. and, and then you had this this well, highlighted well uh, but well then we can yeah. do we can specifically we can do that piece of work even in respect of this um the 155 yeah. and we can look then at uh, those yeah. then uh, who were who were brought into the program yeah i, th I think it would be a very positive Yes. Assurance and reassurance, yes. yeah. and, and, and broadly in terms in terms of other significant programs, yeah. I think they 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 merit um, merit a reasonable evaluation. Notably, um, my concern is against the monitoring committee, despite having the statutory mit to to monitor and evaluate, they didn't do so. Um, the, the the point the point you quite rightly made in the report quite rightly made that there were only eight JLO sergeants. Um, yes. A modest amount, and you're 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 addressing that particular issue. But I'm just yes. just interested in, in passing, in the areas where those eight JLO sergeants operated, was the issue of the non-reporting or non-pursuance of the of the people who were suitable for the referral program. Was it was it better? Um, well, those JLO sergeants are not supervision. They were disconnected then to the return of. Uh, Juveniles to members to prepare and effect a prosecution file. So, you know, if there was correlation there, it would be more excellent yeah. than design because the JLO sergeants would have been supervising the JLO processes of those within 
within the referral scheme, not those without. Because we have on many occasions in this particular forum um, offered some critical observations in relation to the quality and consistency of uh, supervision across across much of the uh, much well, of the force. It, it, within the report, you can see the, the the strength of the the branch dealing with this, and it's only this year that it's been made specifically a national unit with and the sole responsibility of a chief superintendent, who throughout that period would have had a very broad. Uh, remit in terms of the responsibilities and that's provided focus and then <coughs> undertaken in this year to further support that unit uh, beyond its present staffing level as well because um, you know we we talked the last time I, mean, I think in the private session about Pulse 7.3 and just the particular um, KPI key performance indicator there in respect of those those matters which are motor and matters and driving type offences and that does require intervention and and uh, checking as well, yeah. ongoing supervision. Thank, thank you, thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> one, one of the issues in terms of in terms of uh, the review and seeking to seeking to get to the bottom of it was um, was in relation to the analysis of the uh, close to eight thousand referrals, and looking at looking at the reason uh, why they weren't appropriately progressed to a final conclusion because of inaction by Garcia Ishikana, and and of those we had. Um, we had um, 4,700 plus uh, related to time delay matter not progressed by the investigating guard members. We had um, 2,700 guard member reports, no correspondence received. 298 guard member transfer were on guard member had been transferred or was on leave or there was a career break involved. And 147 case was not progressed after direction to prosecute from the DPP or district officer. I personally find those figures quite disturbing. And it probably relates to your to, to your apology. But in terms of that that breakdown, uh, the time delay or matter is is addressed within it. I do have concerns in relation to guard members reporting no correspondence received. I fully appreciate that the, the correspondence was in the nature of manual correspondence, not yes. in the form of email. But that seems uh, seems a, a very significant number. And I'm just again, if we extend extend, if you're assured that the, that the correspondence went out just wasn't received. There are serious concerns in relation to correspondence under other matters as well. Um, if that can be believed. Well, that's in response to the question there. We've, we've embarked on an entirely different process now, which is the consideration yeah. of discipline. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, as, as that carries on, and each case yeah. is, is examined mm -hmm. case by case on, on its merits, mm -hmm. I think we'll have a far greater idea of just exactly what went wrong as yeah. opposed to got lost in the post. Yeah. Yeah. And pointing and I, I, I don't I don't propose uh, I don't propose pursuing pursuing that further for the moment. But one one of the one of the significant issues um, and, and some detail in relation to relation to page sixty two of the report and you came back to it as well um, uh, Commissioner at, at our last meeting, and that's the issue of the um, the 55 serious serious cases. Yes, and you identified at that at, at that particular time the um, the range of uh, the range of cases. Uh, first one in alphabetical order was a fray riot, violent disorder, um, working down to a single case of sexual assault, a single case of rape of female, a single case of hijacking and lawful seizure of a vehicle, air, air, aircraft vessel. A single case of uh, child neglect and cruelty causing explosion. So, quite, quite, quite a significant number, a number of serious cases. Any, any observation now that you've, you've had the interim report, had a time to reflect on it, had, had, had a, uh, a time to think in terms of the consequences, the consequences of that, notably in terms of the people involved and what the consequences are from both the victim perspective and indeed and the, the suspect. Well, I think in particular in that, of that um, table, because it only relates to 55 yeah. um, incidents, and yeah. we could anonymise the reports into those uh, and go into those in some detail, um, because it, um, it, one, of the, one of the feedbacks that we've had in respect of this is that of the 7894 youth referrals, which um, weren't appropriately progressed in respect of a juvenile, we found that in 2,025 cases, others, adults, were either prosecuted or cautioned. So I just, and, and I know from, because I know some of these incidents and in that I've looked at the circumstances of it, um, 
that uh, you have adults have been dealt with and it's the juvenile that wasn't dealt with. So I think if we go into that circumstance... Well, I might be able to help you with sorry, that figure, yes, Paul, yeah. carry on. Just in relation to the 55, um, in 18 cases, in 18 out of those 55 uh, other persons have um, either been charged or um, been cautioned. For example, uh, there's one person listed in the hijacking. There was another person sanctioned in that regard in relation to the causing an explosion. Uh, there's one person listed. There was another person made amenable for that. Um, for the threats to kill, there was one person made amenable for that. The affray, there was seven out of the nine. And in the aggravated burglary, there was six out of the nine where another person um, was made amenable. So, so uh, interventions were lost, but and, and this is where we're having to deal with victims as well. Um, as far as they're concerned, the matter was dealt with. There was prosecution and there was an outcome, but it wasn't complete. And, um, but my overall impression still remains, you know, there was, there was serious criminality, um, not just in, in this group, but in the previous table as well, that should have probably been dealt with. And that's, you know, that's why we've, we've, went, we've went down this extraordinary step of looking at the individuals, the individual members to see actually how they performed their duty in respect of these investigations. So, um, but we are able to provide, particularly around that 55, there's a more manageable number. Um, uh, you know, some of the history and the and yeah. the, the story behind what has happened in respect of those, but um, so it, it's uh, and I didn't know that figure of 2025 the last time I was here. It, I suppose it's of some comfort there that that in some of these cases, other perpetrators and in fact adults were brought to justice yeah. and and the juvenile was lost. But for lots of these cases, that that is not the case. And even there, we've lost an intervention as well. So, um, but at least the victim, in some of these cases, does do do know that someone was brought to justice for this. It's just not complete. You did it. You had, and if I might, might offer you an opportunity again, um, Commissioner, which you dealt with, um, um, I thought quite effectively and sensitively in, in other fora, including here, and that that was the issue of the 57 deaths of people um, of of of. of well, a number of them are over 21 when they actually died, uh, but number 57 people, 57 children at that particular stage um, uh, who were associated with youth deferrals um, and where they weren't progressed to conclusion and who have died in the interim and, you know, quite a significant number from suicide, fatal road traffic um, accidents, drug overdoses and other causes. And you spoke very often in terms of the chaotic lifestyle uh, which a number of these people were, um, uh, were, were involved in. And yet it's a sort of an extraordinary tragic <coughs> circumstance and maybe reflective of that particular environment in um, which this, this has happened. I might like to um, make a further comment on that. Um, well, um, of, the, of those 57, 44 were adults when they died. And in fact, actually, even in the time that I've been aware of, of this matter since... Uh, last September, that, that figure has grown uh, um, by two. So um, uh, these are individuals who are in jeopardy in terms of their health and their lifestyle, and um, that's mental health as well as physical health, but also then um, the dependency on, on drink and alcohol. And so um, it, it is a very sad fact, uh, but a reality of our society that that this group of individuals are particularly at risk and die young and, and die in pretty dire circumstances. Um, they're, um, I've given you the bigger groups, mm. but every case, and, and referred to as other, but within that other, there are very individual cases that I didn't want to uh, outline in, in effect a public document. But again, in, you know, we can provide further detail around that uh, as, as required. And of course the concern always is, Commissioner, you know, was there, oh, was there ever the potential to even, even, even um, uh, mean that there, was, that there was one or two uh, fewer, fewer deaths um, as a consequence of an appropriate intervention? Well, it, I'm speaking, that, I'm, yes, I don't want to add to speculation, yeah, but that's a possibility. We've looked very carefully at that. Um, and we cannot see the direct correlation between I appreciate it. our failure to act and then a subsequent death. But I think the correlation does exist between individuals who come in contact a lot with Vanguard and other agencies 
mm. and this cross him uh, uh, with things such as dependency on drink or drugs and uh, a chaotic lifestyle, mental health and physical health. Um, the, the, the report um, in, covers in detail um, the period between 2010 and 2017, but reflective of the openness of, of, of the report, um, it also looked at pre-2010 and the potential, the potential of um, a, a, a significant number of cases also not being, being progressed appropriately um, when there was a greater emphasis on a paper-based paper system. And certainly the suggestion coming from there is is that the same type of practices or experience existed prior to 2010 as existed post-2010? Um, it may well, but it, you know, also one hears, um, but I'll let Paul come in on this, is that people understood the original paper-based system. Um, but the paper-based system maybe had a, a somewhat different objective. The, the present system has, more, has become more about um, a case and being case ready in a prima facie case, whereas I think this this process, um, certainly during the 2000s and in the 90s, before that, was more about earlier intervention, before actually any offence may have been committed. So I'm uh, one is starting then to really compare two different things. But Paul, can you give any further? Yeah, I work suppose um, the, the time frame that you're referring to was outside of our terms of reference, but for the purpose of completeness and to give context, we decided to go back a few months before and um, it was inconclusive, I suppose, because we took a dip sample of 200 mm -hmm. and there wasn't enough information in the paper-based system that there was that we could draw from later on in the computer-based system. So we couldn't really say whether it was any worse or any better. Um, for that few months that we looked at, it was what it was. Yeah. Um. There's, there's obviously a lot I can ask you about. I'll just take one, one further area, um, and, um, and you may certainly the issue of the summary of the causes, I think, is, is very comprehensively dealt with, as, as indeed your responses uh, in terms of seeking to prevent a reoccurrence. I, I certainly would agree with the, your, your summary of the causes, the causes that, that, um, that led to, and you've identified quite a significant, significant number, a number of them. Um, uh, one of the issues in governance caused me, caused me some concern, and, and this was the you no know, proper record keeping or governance by Garda members at all ranks when directions from the Garda Youth Diversion Office deeming use unsuitable to diversion were sent to district offices. And there, when, when the, the terms that, that crops up quite consistently across the report is the whole issue, the whole issue of culture and your concerns, and the concerns of the authors of the report in relation to a culture which, uh, which facilitated this, um, this, this happening. And, and the concern of the, for the authority is, again, this issue of failure to record effectively, failure, um, failure of governance, failure of supervision, failure of evaluating. The concern is the potential for its, its, um, its evidence elsewhere. Um, and so I, you know, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with your observations, because in, in part you're, you're playing back the observations that we make, okay. but in making these observations, we hope um, that in effect we're breaking uh, a mould and that we've had um, as honest and as reflective and as thorough a look as, that, as we can. We've identified these um, uh, difficulties and issues around governance and culture and with the hope then, once identified, we know what these are, we know the warning signs of them as well and also then what has to be done in terms of governance. Um, the oversight, the supervision, the accountability, make sure it doesn't happen again. So, in taking such um, you know, a thorough and indeed you know, quite uh, caustic towards ourselves, look at this. It, it's, it, it's in part so that we get the full learning, so it doesn't happen again. You know, and so if you can deal with one area why, uh, well, then that that carries across into yes. other areas as, um, of the organisation too. So we want this to be an area of excellence. And then that becomes that imp that uh, impacts in other areas of work, same as we want the area of domestic abuse to be an area of excellence, human trafficking, and serious uh, serious sexual assault. We want all of the, we want all of these areas to to lift in terms of our service delivery and performance. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. I know Judith has a question. Go ahead, Judith. Well, it's actually continuing in the theme of culture. Um, and there is a sense in reading this very comprehensive and helpful report that perhaps juvenile liaison officers were 
um, outside of the PATH system, outside of the operational um, tent, as it were. And I just want to ask you a, a question about the status of juvenile liaison officers within the organisation. How would you characterise their status and the value assigned to the really important operational and crime prevention work that they do? Uh, well, I think, I hope it's illustrated by the manner in which you know, we as an organisation have, have taken this on head on, the importance we place in this. <clears throat> it is an area of work that, that people did take, uh, or purported to take great pride in, and, and the organisation was, was proud of, of uh, its achievements down through the years uh, with this programme. But over a period, um, it slipped away, and it slipped away for the systemic and uh, the systemic and organisational reasons that, that, that we've set out. We want to want to retrieve that, and part of that is actually reinforcing the importance of the, the national office. We've done that by making that a, a national bureau, headed up by a chief super on their own, but secondly then the undertakings that we've given internally about the, the, the resources that will go to this area of work. It is essential, it diverts young people, children and young people from crime and from destructive behaviours, and, and really it prevents crime. So it's obviously an area of importance for us and, and it will be going forward. We feel very much that, um, you know, we, we've done poorly here and we've let down the people who reported crime to us and we've also let down uh, victims, uh, victims of those crimes, but also the young people as well. And we don't want to see a repeat of this. And uh, the measures that we've put in place and the emphasis on this now see no, no reoccurrence of this and we can be sure of that just in terms of the processes that we put in place and as I say the emphasis that we have on this. Thanks Judith. Paul? Yeah, uh, Commissioner you, you talked and I think um, your colleague uh, Chief Super Superintendent Clancy also talked, or Cleary sorry, talked about um, some of the most serious incidents that are outlined in, in Table 20 and how a number of those also had other individuals who were made amenable apart from the, the youth that was responsible. You then refer, I think, yourself to the previous table and the serious <coughs> offences that are included in that. And I'm just because, for instance, to take a couple of examples, there are 82 offences of assault causing harm and I think um, 176 robbery of the person, so pretty serious yes. offences with serious consequences for individuals. Is the analysis that has been done of the offences at, at table 20, has that also been done in relation to the previous table? In other words, are you aware of other individuals who have been made amenable in relation to those matters? Yeah, uh, the, the 2025 that we spoke about, um, I suppose we, we prioritised the 55 more serious, but uh, we, we are in a position to provide uh, the other figures where they impact on this table, table 20, is it? Table 19. Table 19, table 19. yeah. I don't have it today, but I, I can get a few. Okay, thank you. And, and sorry, one other just brief clarification. Um, if you uh, look further into the report at the subsequent serious crime types, <coughs> Table 26, so th those are simply listed as serious crime types, but there are some multiple entries. Um, does each entry represent one crime? So, for instance, there are on that list there are there's the manslaughter, there's two murders. Are they two individual murders? Yeah, the second part, the second. Oh, see, there, no, um, that's, sorry, that's a typo. That should, that's a double up there. Um, there should be only one category for each crime type listed in that table. Okay, but there no indication of the number of offences, sorry, the number of um, individual acts, if you like? So yeah, in other words, if, if, yeah, if there's a category there, does that tell me how many so, individuals so, have been charged with that type of offence. Oh, sorry, yes, yeah, so this is for after um, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the occasion. Uh, it's a cross-section of all offences uh, right, right across the board. Um, we can give you a further breakdown on that in, in the final report. Yeah, I suppose what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, so for instance, if we take burglary as, a, um, as an example, how many individual instances of burglary we're talking about? Yeah, no... They would be huge numbers, I suppose. Huge numbers, okay. You know, if, if you looked, we, we, on average, um, on occasions where we didn't progress to a conclusion, 
uh, those children went on, on average, to, uh, to be have 10 further referrals, 17 further charges. So it'd be multiples uh, of that. That's, that. that's as juveniles. That's and, as juveniles. And, and someone then as adults, okay. their offending will have carried on again. So, you know, you, the, the, these, these children didn't get into the referral scheme because either the nature of the offend or the repeat nature of their offending. And, and so we're in a pattern of behaviour of, of breaking the law in some shape or form. And for many of them, that pattern of behaviour and that, that, that lifestyle and, and behaviour and criminality has carried on right into adulthood. All right, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Commissioner, I have a question on an area that we haven't asked about before. I think I found the answer in the report, so I'm going to read the question and the answer and then maybe ask for your, what I think is the answer, and maybe ask for your um, observations. Um, as I understand it, and, and the report sets out, uh, the definition from the statute is that uh, in order to fulfil the requirements of the statute, the report says, in every case where an offence has been committed and the offender is a child, uh, a referral must be completed, etc. So there's an offence, it's been committed, and there's an offender. And then, this is the issue that I had intended to ask you about, which is, in your examination of the cases that were not followed through on, 4,800 and odd were not proceeded with because of insufficient evidence. So I was kind of perplexed if you have an offender and an offence, and arguably, according to the definition and admission, how come there wasn't enough of evidence in four and a half thousand cases. Okay. So I was going to ask you that. Yes. And then I turned to the report on page 96 where it says, a practice appears to have emerged whereby Gardaí, in some cases, applied a lower standard of proof when investigating offences committed by child offenders, having made the assumption that the child would be included in the programme and there would not be a need to prove the case in court. And I suppose the question that's left for me, if I'm right in my answer to myself, the question that's left for me is, were some of these children referred without them actually being proven to be offenders? Um, and put in a position of making an admission. And this isn't just the children that, this is not just the children that were not processed finality. This might also include children who were. It's kind of a strange point that you have an offender, and you, you need to have an offender, but you have no evidence, or insufficient evidence. So, am I, does that make sense? Because that's how I'm adding these, yeah, I suppose. or connecting these elements in the, in, in the report. Well, I suppose the, the, the category uh, that you're referring to, insufficient evidence to proceed, uh, and we list 4,851 uh, referrals in that case. Um, but. It's not only that the guards didn't believe that they needed the same level of proofs. The majority of those figures were made up of um, witnesses not, key witnesses not making statements and following through, which meant there was insufficient evidence. CCTV subsequently not being available. Uh, no drug certs. For example, a lot of them would have been in possession of drugs, which it would have been taught would have been drugs, but when the cert came back, it actually wasn't drugs, so the evidence was there. But also, uh, the district officer, uh, or indeed the DPP, would have made the decision that there was insufficient evidence, despite the guard submitting his uh, case file. So um, that would be the case in the majority of those 4,851. And I think what we are trying to do um, with the causes was to give a very open and honest picture of what we felt uh, may have happened. Um, but I suppose to, to tag that to the 4,851 is not, not exactly clear. That there's, other, there's other elements involved. Well, I guess, I mean, and as, as already acknowledged, we do genuinely welcome the detail and clarity and openness in the report. We wouldn't be able to ask the hard questions otherwise. So, so, uh, so I, I do want to acknowledge that. This is not, it's simply, it, it troubled me a bit that you, you must have an offender and still you hadn't evidence. And I wondered whether there's any risk of other aspects of Garda in action buried in there. In other words, insufficient efforts to collect the evidence, uh, which you haven't classified under the inaction category, or is there a risk of, of um, children well, simply being compliant 
no. uh, with we, guards we, and saying, yeah, sure, if you want me to admit we, this, we I'm the programme. We have went into that level of detail in our examination. Um, we manually went through 22,174 referrals and the level of corroboration that we uh, insisted upon was of a very high standard. We looked for copies of notebooks, we looked for copies of reports, and we looked for everything um, before we would categorise it. So if we did come across a situation whereby the guard didn't go to the extent that he should have in collecting evidence, that would be um, packaged for, uh, we'll say, the discipline. Okay. okay. Thank you for that, Paul. Thanks, Commissioner. Sure. Vicky? Can I follow, follow on from that same point, though, and ask... I mean, this, this idea of the lower standard of proof being applied, linking it back to the earlier point that was made about vetting, is, is there a concern that any of these young people would have had effectively a black mark against them in terms of vetting when the standard of proof wasn't actually reached? So, I mean, the vetting thing comes up in two dimensions. Did anyone, you know, were, were they not um, deemed unsuitable for a job where they should have been, but also were people deemed unsuitable who shouldn't have been because the standard of proof hadn't actually been met? No, I, I think, um, again, an, an extensive investigation, and we went into much detail around the vetting, and I'm still liaising with the superintendent in charge of the National Vetting Bureau. Um, so the, vet, the, the legislation which covers vetting, uh, whilst it allows for us to provide criminal record uh, details, it also allows uh, us to provide what are called specific information. Mm. And I suppose that means where there's a suggestion or an allegation or a prima facie case that someone may have harmed another person, that that information can be provided. So in the case of this examination, we have 155,000 referrals over the seven year period. The fact that they were referrals, you would hope that there would be a prima facie case, which, which is your question. But if there was any suggestion that these people were involved in harming another, well then that information could be given. But my question is actually the opposite. Right. Was, was information potentially being given when it shouldn't have been because there wasn't a prima facie case because the guards were applying a lower standard? I suppose just to, to give you a detail on that, what we have requested, um, we have provided the Vetting Bureau with a list of all the children over the mm -hmm. period and we have requested from them if, if they have received any vetting applications in respect of any of these okay. children. Okay. So okay. Now, yeah. that's a body of work because of the large numbers involved and I'm told that we should have that information back in two to three weeks. Uh, so we'll include that in the final report. That's we'll great try to, to capture all, all that information. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Paul, that's very reassuring. And I mean, as you'll have seen from the questioning, I suppose what we're trying to do is take the lessons, as you said yourself, Commissioner, yeah. and see do those risks exist elsewhere. Um, and, and from that point of view, the, culture, the cultural references in the report are very, um, are very interesting and, and, and useful. I'm now going to move on, if my colleagues are contented, to uh, the final item, uh, which relates to the divisional model uh, of uh, structure for the organisation. This is um, an approach to organising yourselves that was recommended by the Guard Inspectorate. The authority had a look at your approach to piloting and published a report on it a number of months ago. It's now gone live, so it seemed appropriate to, to get an update and see how, how the rollout is going, and, and Bob Collins is going to lead for us on that. Thanks, Chair. And um, for the benefit of those who are uh, here listening or listening or will listen in, in, <clears throat> in other ways, might be useful very briefly to recall that the divisional model was an attempt, is an attempt, is an intent uh, to reshape the management, the local management of the Garda Síochána on a functional specialist basis rather than on the geographic basis which the existing districts represent, just to put it as, as simply as that. It has been the subject of a very significant amount of, of work at all levels within the Garda Síochána and has been the subject of very substantial levels of engagement uh, over the last two and a half years, um, well two years uh, certainly, between the authority and the, and the Garda Síochána. And now, as the Chair has said, it has gone live in those four areas where it was um, being piloted, they being Cork City, um, Dublin Metropolitan Region South, um, Galway and Mayo. Well, the first question is, and almost all of this work was 
part of your inheritance when you arrived last September. It had been it had been done before you came. Do you think that the divisional model, that divisional structure, is the appropriate one for the future of the organisation? Uh, well, um, before I just pass over to, uh, to John and Meg about this, I think um, it's important to say um, what, we, what we want to do is to make sure that our divisional structure is fit and proper in terms of providing local policing services, probably for, to deal with the great majority of what goes on in that, in that division. They'll be supported by the national units in terms of, of specialism, and we've, you know, we've already talked about some of the, what some of that might be um, in terms of protective services, should it be um, human trafficking or uh, organized crime and involved in drugs or, or um, uh, other forms of, of uh, larger scale criminality. But by and large, a division should be self-sufficient. Uh, it's a pretty well tried and tested model, a chief superintendent uh, leading, leading a, um, a unit in and around seven to eight hundred personnel, but those seven to eight hundred personnel being concentrated on providing a locally based policing service, but in within the, the corporate framework of Angarda Shikana, responsive in terms of the policing plan, but also then responsive in terms of the local characteristics of the area that they police. And, and that works. It gives um, ge geographic autonomy, uh, but also an autonomy uh, to the chief superintendent and to his staff, but also then um, an autonomy in terms of how they deal with those local issues, because the resource they have sufficient resources to do the great majority of the policing required in, a, in an area. And now it's it, you know it, it, I think it's for us then to see how we then we 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 create that within. You know, what's already been said around divisional policing because the inspectorate have had a lot to say, your own, your own reports around the implementation of this, of this model have, have also provided advice and guidance and indeed then the Commission of Future Policing had quite a lot to say then about local community-based uh, community policing. And so it's in, that, uh, it's in that essence that we're taking this on. We want this in effect to be the main building block of the organisation and that the rest uh, headquarters, the national, the national units are acting in support. So in some ways, we're sort of turning the, the focus on the organisation upside down, and I do think that's viable. And I do think, you know, policing is a, is by and large a locally delivered service, and, and this is a unit to deliver that. One of the points of frequent discussion and debate between the authority and the guard, the Shikona, had been about the precise nature of the model that would be chosen. Uh, two aspects of that. One, whether it should be precisely as the inspectorate recommended, which isn't quite what is being implemented. Uh, uh, and secondly, whether in the pilot phase in the four divisions chosen, it might have been useful to evaluate or to look at a variety of models or at least to have some variation in the models so that you could have um, differential responses to look at. Are you satisfied that the model that has been chosen is the one that would work? And is there likely to be flexibility in terms of making ultimate decisions for the future based on the experience that you will get over the next while with these four Divisions. Um, so, uh, this is pro perhaps more, a, you know, a hybrid model. We're moving from what is it, you know, purely a geographic model and uh, everything being focused on the district officer, the superintendent, uh, and we are moving to more fun functional model. I, I just have to say that my experience is, that in the end, somebody must ultimately take responsibility for the full gamut of everything that happens in a geographical area. And the problem with a functional model on its own, and we're getting into a lot of detail is here, that things slip through the cracks and they end up with the chief superintendent's desk because he's the last individual who's got that wide geographic mm. responsibility. And, and um, you know, I take, you know, I take very seriously what the inspector say and, and what they've put forward, but we've gone this with this hybrid model for the moment. This isn't written in, hasn't been put down a tablet of stone. Uh, we need to 
um, part of the learning of this is, you know, the need to be adaptable and, and agile to the local circumstances and indeed to what the evaluation shows. So uh, I think we've, we've entered into this in, in terms of a learning opportunity, what this flags up. And even though they do look similar, there are different approaches between the different divisions and that's even just a learning point about managing such a change project. But we are committed to changing the divisional model and, and this is a step along the way. But you know, by the end of this year, we'd be pretty fixed on what the new divisional model should be. Very good. Uh, like you, I don't want to get into a level of detail that will um, bamboozle the listeners um, because uh, some of us have spent a lot of time engaging on this topic. Yeah. But maybe there's a number of key questions that have a more general application and that have more general relevance. The first is, if somebody would say a word about the evaluation that took place of the of the pilot phase, we, we don't know. I, we haven't seen any document. I'm not sure if there is a document available. But if you could say something about that evaluation and what the principal lessons that were learned from that was, and how, and whether they have influenced the way it's being brought into operation at the moment. Yeah, yes, yes. yes. Um, <coughs> there's two phases to the evaluation. There's evaluation in the context of learning from wherever you come from when we started out in 2017, and there's a more formal structure to the evaluation of what we now have in place. Uh, in terms of what we now have in place, we went to a lot of work in terms of uh, going out and measuring where we were before we started off the process. Uh, we went to the four divisions. We went to other divisions who were not involved in the policing to see, so we could benchmark against those particular divisions to see if are the public happy or more satisfied in terms of are we giving a better service to the, to the public uh, are our own customers within the organization satisfied that you know this is proven to be giving providing a better service so we have to that process a uh, very formal structured process I suppose uh, be in the process in the position to be able to evaluate uh, on a initially on a three month basis as we roll it out and at the end of that uh, 12 month period we'll be able to do full evaluation of um, what's been the impact of the divisional policing model in those particular four hubs? So that process is there. It's, it's a um, it's very structured and formalised. Uh, in addition, to, I suppose the changes that we have made since we started out in 2017 and since we um, engaged with the various stakeholders who were influencing and shaping how we went about uh, developing the model. So answers to your question there. Is there a risk that it could be too too structured? Because at, at times one saw something of a tension between enthusiastic autonomy uh, in individual divisions and centralised desire uh, to show that there was there was some measure of cohesion across the organisation. But it can be it can be too structured. Or are you happy that it's not? Well, I suppose put a formal structure in there, it means that we are measuring uh, against set criteria across the four divisions and as they benchmark that against other divisions that are not part okay. of it. So we oh, can okay. see, okay, here we are, we started out, is it influencing and, and uh, compare that to, in case there are other, influ other factors that are influencing the wider organisation they want to show. So to be able to isolate and see, well, are these four divisions changing comparatively because of what we're doing, um, that formal structure is there. Of course, we're going to have to be, I suppose, careful how we evaluate that process in itself and the information we get back to make sure that people well, aren't uh, manipulating the data in any particular way. So certainly we'll be open to that. And is there an independent dimension to that evaluation, or will there be? We have, we would say, our consultants who are helping us developing it. They're the people who came up with the criteria, so yeah. we'll be using them uh, to independently, I suppose, right. assess how the performance is going past the four one of the concerns that was expressed at some stages was that what's described as the community engagement hub, uh, that part of the structure, could end up by being the district, uh, writ small or writ large, whichever way you want to put it, and that the superintendent in charge of a community engagement hub would effectively be the district officer retitled. Is there... Are there mechanisms in the way in which this scheme has gone live in the four divisions that will avoid that happening? Well, I suppose it's important to reassure the public that 
that superintendent who was out there leading uh, frontline policing is still out there leading the frontline policing in terms of those respective geographical areas, all they all that be their ge larger geographical areas now. The supports that are there to help them do that, that's what we have brought back to the divisional structure. So in terms of the whole admin, management, financial element, we have taken all that quite heavy lifting, I suppose, away from the frontline superintendent so that they can focus on delivering community policing out there to the within the, each of the, the geographical areas that they now have responsibility for it. Um, I think it's important that the communities, they're still dealing with that superintendent delivering frontline policing service, except the difference is that superintendent isn't or doesn't have all the abstractions they had in the past in terms of which took them away from being their capacity to do that. They're no longer involved in prosecutions of court. They don't have to do discipline investigations. They don't have to worry about the admin signing off on all those forms. So, I mean, the net effect should be that superintendent is now able to focus more on delivering that service and engaging more with the community, engaging more with the stakeholders who collectively, because police, we can't solve, we say, all the difficulties in communities on our own. We need the, the cooperation of the other agencies. So we believe that this would now enable them to engage in that type of stakeholder engagement and look at how we're going to solve problems collectively. So that will be part and parcel of that superintendent. But that superintendent is still policing that area, that superintendent will still bring the knowledge and experience ahead, working with those communities right back into those communities. Without diminishing for a second the significance of the local dimension in policing, because every citizen perceives policing in an absolutely local way because how it affects me or my family or my neighbours. Is there sufficient certainty uh, or focus in the way the divisional model is being introduced to ensure that a whole range of things will operate on a divisional basis, not just the admin side, but that a whole lot of the key elements of policing will operate consistently across the division, and that it, it won't simply be a grouping of districts in a division, which is more or less what we have at the moment. Well, if you look at the whole area, even of crime investigation, we'll say in the past, the superintendent was responsible for crime in their area. Uh, and often serious crime distracted them away from it. Now we have a full-time crime superintendent in every division so that we can ensure there is consistency in terms of how we investigate all serious crime across the division, whether it's a murder, uh, whether it's involved with the practice service unit. We, will, we can ensure now that we will get that standardized service delivery across the entire division um, with the way we, we, we're structured with the divisional policing model. Right. But, but the thing, probably the thing is the district officer, we're going to have to just reimagine that and that's going to move towards more towards the divisional commander. So if you take another area um, like public order where the, dis where the district officer is, you know, written into that policy, we're going to have to change that. Yeah. So, you, you know, that, that, that position as such is going to break down because responsibilities are being... Uh, diffused and then redefined, okay. and uh, redef a lot of them will be redefined actually to the divisional officer, the chief superintendent. Good, you, you've you've answered my next question because I was just because of the the, imp <laughs> the changing the way in which the existing structure is described and defined and lim limited, perhaps, yeah. will be an important part of the adaptation. There's one other aspect of that again, which we have discussed at public and private meetings over the last. Um, uh, 38 months, and that is there has been a pattern that the appointment of district officers, the tenure of appointment has been remarkably short and a high degree of mobility, um, which can be understandable but can also be a bit dizzying because somebody is no sooner into a district than one mighty leap or hero was free or at least was on to somewhere else. Is there a greater likelihood? of consistency, of longer tenure, of real capacity for, particularly for divisional officers in the new arrangement, to have that, this clear association with their area of responsibility, which will be sustained over, over time to enable them more fully to understand the requirements of the division. Well, sorry, John. You yeah, I think that's the desired position. Um, and certainly it, from, from where we're sitting here, to have district or superintendents in charge of particular areas or a divisional officer uh, in, a, in a certain area uh, for a, a period of time is certainly the desired position of what we're trying to achieve. 
um, it is not always it is not always uh, possible for that to do because of the ever changing nature and the quick moving uh, nature of, of the organisation. But it's, it's it's clearly our intention here is to provide that stability in local in local communities. It has been commented on in in, in various different reports that 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 point that that you make, but it is not always possible. By, by the way the appointments are made and people you know, moving around locations and the fact that people retire and people promote, there is always going to be that constant churn. But certainly from our perspective here, as we sit here, the intention is to try and stabilise that as much as we can and reduce mm -hmm. that period and that time by making sure at the outset the appointments are, 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 are as appropriate as we possibly can be to, to, to that area that best fit. But, but may, may I also say just there is a, um, a, a way of maybe managing that is just the continuity of, of, of the overall members as well. Uh, in, you know, there's a study somewhere about the two ranks the public recognise is the guard and the sergeant and everything else is just a bit of a, 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 a you know, unknown ambiguity to them. And so you know, we concentrate a lot on you know, uh, the superintendent but perhaps it's about the local relationship, and I'd look to the guard, the sergeant, and the inspector also to build up, you know, long-term relationships that can make a difference as well. If we, if we place it all on what's the superintendent doing, then then we're bound to have those, you know, gaps in, deli in, in delivery and changes of personnel. Because by and large, superintendents are people sort of on the march, and they do move. You get far more stability if we think about our sergeants, and inspectors, and our guards as well. I understand that point. Absolutely, in as much as it relates, as it touches on the relationship between citizens and the, the guardy with whom they have that continuing in, engagement and contact. But, but the leadership dimension within a division is, an, is a crucially yeah, important yeah. part of the role of a division officer, at the moment a district officer, and the continuity of presence is a really important part, so that the district officer knows the inspectors and uh, the sergeants and the guards in the area, which can't readily be the case at the moment where sometimes the speed of turnover is as rapid as it is. And it, it doesn't, for a second, diminish the importance of the point you make about that yeah. human-local relationship. But the leadership dimension, um, and I, I use the term leadership rather than management because it, it's... it's perhaps in this context, the more critical of those two principles, that's the one that I think must have suffered in circumstances where a, a district officer was no sooner into a district and was on the move again. Um, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a balance to be drawn between flexibility and um, a spinning top uh, relationship with a, 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 an area. One of the issues that arose a number of times was that of resources. The adequacy of the resources to make this work, the extent to which this new system would liberate resources so that they could be distributed uh, elsewhere in frontline policing. What's your sense, Commissioner, of how, of how that will work and how do you see that in terms of when the divisional model is spread right throughout the country? Um, well, the, the divisional model that will roll out um, will mean fewer divisions, and so that is, you know, management on costs will be saved and pretty substantial management on costs of that in terms of both um, at the chief superintendent and superintendent rank. And uh, we're still in the process of just building up what the divisional structure will look like, um, but there will be savings just in, um, in terms of, of management. The other thing is then is just the autonomy that the... Um, uh, divisional commander will have and their autonomy to make the decisions obviously within a corporate framework and hopefully then you know just the, the sheer bureaucracy and administration that there is at the moment with constantly things flowing backwards and forwards um, to, to headquarters and, and through various levels of command as well those are all savings but even what we've in, uh, what we've done already there are savings and I look to John to, just to, to set out what the actual savings we've achieved in these four pilots have been Okay. Well, in terms of how we structure it, I suppose just if we could come back for, for a second, Bob, to so an earlier point you make, we have set out under a new model a very clear role and responsibility for each of the individual ranks. So the divisional officer has a clear understanding now of what his role and responsibilities are under the new model. So each area of responsibility, that has all been done and, and, and has, been, uh, has been issued. In the context of 
the, the restructuring and the realignment uh, of all of the uh, of the four divisions, we have managed to release, you know, a reasonable number. You know, it would be in in, in excess of 70 people have been re, re, reallocated to frontline duties as a consequence of, of what we're doing. Now, again, we can't. Uh, I don't want people to multiply that by numbers or anything I'm like not, that. I'm not doing that uh, some at the moment. <laughs> so uh, next meeting. But it, but I think I, I think I think what it has what it has what we have mm. learned is that in, even within the model in itself and the restructuring and the realignment and the streamlining of various different processes, it has enabled us to create efficiencies. So you know I know that in 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 the, in the Cork City area, they have a far greater. Uh, community policing uh, presence now as a consequence of the restructuring. So it uh, has been considerable be benefits in terms of, even at this stage, so even in the very early stages of it, we now know that we have a greater visibility and a greater presence on the street of uniform Gardaí, even from the work that we've done at this stage. And that was an important factor in terms of going out and reassuring our external stakeholders, look, you're not, you're not losing a super then here. In fact, we're going to give you better service afterwards. So, you know, when we sat down and met the say senior people in Cork City, Lord Mayor, etc., and you know, explain, look, this is what we're doing, you know, then they can see the logic of, actually, there's going to be a benefit here for us on the street with more community guarantee, which is what I think most uh, division or communities are looking for out there. So. I, 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 you're right, absolutely right, and I think it, and it's, it's, it's good to know that, that there has been that movement of, of um, guarantee from administrative to uh, policing duties, and there's no... Uh, in all of this, an important role for Garda staff in the new arrangements, professional con contribution to the work of the of the divisions. A final point, um, Chair, and that is the way in which roads policing will be managed divisionally. That was one of those topics that was the subject of extensive discussion over the period. Did the evaluation yield any new insights on that, or is that an area where you will that you would look at over the course of 2019 and then make a, a decision based on that, or are you fixed on where things are at the moment? No, I don't think we could say that we're fixed at this stage. If we look at the, the debate around roads policing, um, not only with it on Garrett yeah. but in a lot of <coughs> law enforcement agencies, divisional versus regional is just an ongoing debate. So uh, um, I think the pilot has to be allowed run its course to enable us come to the best conclusion. And the conclusion may be that one size does not fit all. So you look at maybe in, in, in a larger urban centre like Dublin, it should be regional. And in a smaller rural area, you know, it might, it might be something different. If you have an area with a lot of uh, motorways and national roads, that's something different again. So certainly I think what, 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 what we know at this stage is it's something we need to allow the pilot provide the answers for because my own sense is that it isn't one size fits all. Well, to say welcome very much that that flexi flexible approach to it because it was an area which looked as if it might have been fixed in a particular way which wouldn't necessarily have been beneficial uh, in, in the widely differing circumstances that apply across the state. And I think just the last thing that I want to say, Chair, is to... It's important to mark the fact that the new... Uh, model has been introduced into the four divisions. Um, the authority said at one stage that this potentially was one of the most significant structural changes in the life of the organization. And I suppose that we would urge uh, that there be as open and as willing to learn an approach uh, in this first phase and that the, the way in which the division model is introduced thereafter, with all of its benefits, would be... Would be um, would be embraced with as much energy as possible and it just we mark the fact that it's happening and we will be uh, like the skiverine eagle we will be observing closely as it goes and just one final item that you mentioned in that report that you know, it seemed that we were looking at the divisional model in isolation just to reassure that you know we're looking beyond that now in terms of our next operating model commissioner that yeah, uh, yeah. it's not just divisions but we're looking at the regions and the national structure so we're certainly we're building in the learning from the divisional policing model and how that interacts and the opportunities that will present for us as we go thank you thank you bob anybody want to follow up on that i have a quick question and then i know judith has one aob just to reassure you, we're almost done. Um, 
Assistant Commissioner Finn spoke very passionately there about the superintendents being freed up, and I quote, they won't have to be signing off on all those papers and all those forms, because they could be doing what they want, what they need to be doing. Who is signing off on all the forms, and if it is the Guard of Staff, are they adequately empowered from a governance point of view? Do you know, it's easy because everybody knows that managers don't like paperwork. That's universal, but it's part of the responsibility. So could you just make sure, yeah. reassure us that though all those forms that they're not signing are being properly? Everything is authorised. We'll say if somebody, if um, I spend money out of my budget, we'll say I have to approve it in the start. Now at the end of the process, when that approval is there, we have an assistant principal who is looking at all that to make sure that there is compliance and that uh, all the supporting documentation authorization is there. Uh, but that work is now taken away from the superintendent. Once they authorise it first day, they don't have to worry about it anymore. We have the AP who is there leading out in the, our new business side of it, the house who uh, is authorised and has the authority to do that. And they're suitably you know, empowered to challenge their uniform colleagues? and trained and putting this support mechanism around it so they can do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Judith. Uh, Commissioner, finally, you'll be pleased to know. Um, I don't intend to get into the detail of the homicide review, um, but I want to ask a broad question about it um, because we're awaiting the fourth report. Um, and I want to acknowledge the progress that has been made in this area and the helpful approach uh, from your colleague, uh, Brian Sutton. But my question is about the learning and uh, building investigative capacity within the organization and ensuring that lessons are learnt going forward. Uh, because we know from the homicide review that there have been investigative issues, not just data quality issues identified. And we know from other reports, uh, commissions of inquiry, and our own work in committee around detections, that there have been basic investigative issues identified around things like witness statements, CCTV, house to house, exhibit handling, uh, and supervision issues around um, investigations not being progressed because members are on career breaks or annual leave or, or sick leave, whatever it might be. And we know you're putting a lot of faith in the new investigative management system, and it's great to hear that it's being rolled out, it's going live within the next few weeks. That's really good news. But we also know from the youth diversion scheme that IT alone will not address basic investigative issues. So my question to you is around, are you concerned about the level of investigative capacity within the organization generally? Uh, and if so, what are your plans to deal with those concerns? Um, well, I have to say there's there are very good people engaged in crime investigation and, and um, I make a point of it where there's major crime, uh, major crimes including murder uh, investigations ongoing and live at the moment. I, I always make a point of getting out and calling and seeing people. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any query about the, the quality of the people we have engaged. Uh, I do think um, some of our, you know, frankly, some of the national units do need further bolstering and, and building up. Um, and that's around pretty critical areas of serious uh, criminality. But we're not facing the situation where um, that um, our colleagues are in England and Wales, where no one's interested in being a detective. People still have a desire to become detectives and develop their career in that way. So it's a very positive thing, and, and we want to build on that. I think the, my responsibility and the responsibility of the senior team is to put in place the systems and processes which support that. So, um, and it's clear, you know, what you're reflecting on in terms of the homicide review, but even when you look at Anne Kassan, it's, it's, the, it's office management around major inquiries or serious crime investigation. And you're right, the IT doesn't suit that, or it doesn't fix that on, of itself. You have to add to that the supervision and training and, and appropriate processes then as well. And so um, we know when we get the uh, investigation management system rolled out. That's only really the start. See how well that works and how well then it works with, um, you know, in effect, category A homicides, for instance. It was designed as a major 
investigation management system, but we want to be sure that that's fit for purpose and then constantly being evaluated in that, but also evaluated in our skills and the skills we have in the organisation um, for detective work. Uh, Chair, if you'd indulge me for one second uh, for a further question. It's, it's as much the capacity of the frontline uniform first responders as it is about the national investigative units who are dealing with the high-end crime. So are you concerned about the investigative capacity well, of your uniform resources as well? Well, the, um, so specifically from the, um, the 41 uh, investigations, when the terms of reference and, and the learning points, those recommendations do touch upon um, uh, some of the fundamentals of investigation. Uh, so we've asked for uh, governance around those, those will become a standing item on our senior leadership team meetings and then we'll have owners and we will look then to um, implementation and we'll add to those then the learning that we have from the reviews we're doing of the domestic homicide as well. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on my side? Commissioner, is there anything you'd like to add or conclude with well, it, before I we just, close? Could I just conclude publicly thanking uh, uh, AC, AC Lee, um, uh, detect, our Chief Superintendent Paul Cleary and his team for the quality of this report and uh, it's been uh, a great sort of uh, comfort to me the quality of this endeavour and how well it's been put together and hopefully you can read it in the same light. Thank you, I think we're very happy to endorse that. Thank you Paul, well done. Um, we noted in our private meeting earlier, which before you joined us, that this is actually the 50th meeting of the authority, believe it or not. Now you haven't been at all of them. And, um, and even, even as Deputy Commissioner Toohey hasn't been at all of them. Uh, but it's quite an interesting, um, it's quite an interesting milestone, so uh, it, it, it's worth noting. Um, so thank you again for coming along today. Thank you for your, the manner you've engaged with us. We'll see you at the end of March again, and uh, we look forward to getting your final report, Paul. Thanks very much.